I think I'd presume that Arthur was just a very temporary interlude. I'd never imagine there'd be anything after Arthur. I'd go my own way and do whatever I had in mind. But two days before Arthur died, Granny came. And of course, Granny and Arthur's death completely absorbed me. But not only that, I had a letter from a hospital, very, I don't quite know how it came about, about an ex-TB, uh, Alf Wilmot. And so a few days later, he came. And this was a completely new situation. He could walk about and so on. He was a Londoner from Stoke Newington, in a completely different setting, wasn't used to it. Then, uh, throughout those months for the rest of the year, all sorts of people came. And they were so different, that's my memory now. We had uh, dear Miss Permain, she was the most gentle, gentlewomanly woman, you know, I mean, she'd be used to a quiet, nice life. So she was given the room to herself. And she sort of had a little bit of Victorianism in there in her little room. We had Mrs. Wilkes, who'd been in service. And then unexpectedly, we had um, a, a post office uh, engineer who'd um, had an accident and he'd broken his arm. His arm was right up stiff like this. And he worked. He was the hardest worker I've ever seen. He, he could, with his other hand, he could use a, a little sickle and uh, cut the banks. And my memory of that summer is lawns, grass, they were all growing up. We had an antiquated uh, mower, and I knew that if once the lawn <laughs> got above the capability of the mower, we were finished. So there was no time to think, you know, uh, that it was just day to day and keeping going and not really knowing how to do it. There was no time to think. But by the next summer, uh, I think we had 24 patients, we called them then, I did have some help. We had um, one of the um, TB patients was a nurse. She couldn't do anything, but she could tell me what to do. And uh, she had very strong ideas about what should be done and uh, how I was doing it and I was doing it wrong, and obviously I was. And the more I looked back, the more I wonder how we got away with it. I think we had 12 TB patients in all. And it was very disconcerting because the, the hospitals would write and say, we've got a so-and-so, and he's just finished his treatment, he just needs two or three weeks convalescence, would you take him? And I'd say yes, and when I, he came down, I'd realise he was a terminal case. He was highly infective. In other words, the hospital had uh, not really given me the full facts in order to get rid of him. Well, I'm sure that things must have changed nowadays. It wouldn't happen now, no doubt. Uh, hospitals were under great pressure then. They had to release their beds. But I was left with um, at least five highly infective TB patients. The only means I had of uh, disposing their sputum was to boil it on a primer stove and uh, put it down the loo or, or bury it. That, that's all that I could do. So it was very unsatisfactory. But at the same time, there was a remarkable togetherness, if I can use that phrase, in the home. We were all absolutely involved. Everybody had to help. And when we got a, a request for a, take in somebody else, I'd get everybody together. And I'd say, well, we haven't got any room, so-and-so. We've had this request. What do we do? And I can remember vividly Ted leaning against the um, mantelpiece with his arm, which was up like this, and putting his other hand up and saying, I vote for bringing him in. It made you feel that we hadn't asked for this, that it was put on top of us. And we were just doing our poor best, because it was a poor best, to look after them. But something had to be done, and uh, I did what, what a lot of people in England do, and they can't really see the next step, <laughs> formed a committee. So that was the beginning of the committee. But gradually the committee took charge, very effectively, very nicely, and of course they began to rationalize, to simplify and work out a system. Well, the committee was taking charge, and I began to think, well, my job is virtually over. So I, I was going through another complete sort of change of way of life. And uh, again, I think I was bewildered and lost. I didn't know where I was. 
I decided that I'd go off and uh, take a job. And uh, I was given a job with Barnes Wallace, who was, um, you know Barnes Wallace or know of him, designer of the swing wing. He was working on the swing wing then. So I used to spend my weekends at Lee Court and the week working for Barnes Wallace. I, I really, I was torn in two. Half my heart was in Lee Court, half was trying to come to grips with a job with which I was really unfamiliar. Anyhow, this took me down to Cornwall, to a, a very, very bleak part of Cornwall, but a beautiful part of Cornwall, Prydanic, near the Lizard. We had this remote airfield with these highly secret flying tests. It was an RAF uh, station, been built for the war and then left. And here was the station headquarters, SHQ as we knew it. Uh, the hub of the whole station, abandoned. People are broken in, cars are broken in, the winds are broken in. The winds are very high at Pradanic. They absolutely tear across that moor. And it was really waiting to be used. One felt that. Lee Court was full, but it was running. And then we got a, a different application. This was from a young man, a boy, who had, uh, in effect, epilepsy. He was a tough, he was a tough man, he was a frogman. And uh, he had no family, and he said, whenever I get into a boarding house, when they find out what's the matter with me, they turn me out. Lee Court wouldn't take him. They said, we can't have an epileptic here amongst the residents. It'll be dangerous. I didn't think I could turn him away. I didn't feel like turning him away. So I invited him down to Pradanic, where I was living in a little cottage, very small cottage, just so that I could see him. When he got there, I realized that he wanted something to do. And on this aerodrome, Pradanic, was, was the old station headquarters. And I thought, well, I'll get hold of that. And so Michael began to work there, and then I began to help him in the evenings. And uh, the next thing was that uh, we decided we'd, we'd make a start in this old building with a second home. Of course, today it's unthinkable that you could put disabled people into a building like that. It really was, as you can see, a utter shambles. But the funny thing was they loved it because they'd all come from hopeless positions. They had nothing to look forward to. Here there was at least a companionship. There was a sense of purpose because everybody felt, well, let me do something to help. Then our first Christmas, we had nothing proper to give the household of 10, and it was, a special dinner. Two days before Christmas, a little boy walked up with a duck, and he won this in a raffle. Uh, and he decided, he was only 11, and he decided instead of having it himself, he'd give it to St. Teresa's, as we called the home. And that really made the Christmas dinner, but in a double sense, because they knew it had come from this little boy. Well, this was really now bringing me to the moment of truth. Lee Court was full, St. Teresa's was full, but not only that, uh, we were beginning to get uh, all sorts of different people. Uh, I don't know how to describe them, but I think perhaps social misfits. Very, very difficult to turn them down. And so I realized that I was going to have to make up my mind either to carry on with Barnes Wallace and do this in my spare time, or whether to take the plunge and give up Barnes Wallace and go back full time to the home. And I decided, in fact, I think it was obvious, that uh, my heart lay in the home more than in Barnes Wallace, and the two didn't mix. So I took that decision, and I, I regretfully left Barnes Wallace, now Sir Barnes Wallace. And then I decided, as I had time, that I'd take the misfits, if that's the right, not quite the right word, um, into a third home, another building on the, uh, the been the WAF officer's mess. <laughs> it was almost worse state than uh, station headquarters. But I think that although I meant this well, it was a mistake. I think that I was beginning to get a bit lost with these. I didn't really know how to look after them. I'd not been frightfully well, and every now and then I used to go down with a fever, and people used to make fun of me and think, well, 
you don't seem to be. Well, you making, you're making, what's, is something on your mind? And one day a priest said, you're coming over to Hale as a hospital and x-rayed. So I agreed to be x-rayed. I had my x-ray. The doctor came in and he said, you're going straight to bed. You've got TB, you've got a large hole in one lung. You're not even going back to collect your things. And the way he said it, there was nothing for it. So I stayed in hospital. The one thing that was a mercy to me was that the day before a voluntary help had come, I said, would you like some help with typing? And all that day, right late till the night, we'd done the letters and I'd finish all the letters. And uh, so when the doctor said, you stay, I felt that I could. That definitely was the end of a, a period for me. And although I didn't know it at the time, the beginning of quite a new one.